One of the biggest significance of the story of the Old Testament is that it helps us understand what we have in Christ today. I dare say God played out physically what he had prepared for us in Christ spiritually. In fact, if you study the Old Testament writings very well, you'd understand more of the New Testament. Starting from Abraham's call, he was a native of Ur of the Chaldees. He spoke Sumerian and worshipped the moon as God. God called him to leave his native land to what he termed a land of promise. He said he would give his seed the land and bless him. Abraham's descendants would later adopt the Hebraic language, which was a type of language the occupants of Canaan spoke. I like to see that as a type of speaking in tongues we have today. We are translated from one kingdom to another and then we receive the gift of speaking in a new language. Just my thoughts though. They were speaking a different language because of the different places they found themselves. Maybe when they were in Egypt they might have been speaking the Egyptian language. So, pardon my loose inference. Back to the discussion. God's promise to Abraham was strictly about Jesus Christ, not primarily physical lands. But, God taught or revealed his ultimate plan of Christ to him and us through the physical experiences of Abraham and his descendants. So, God used Isaac as a type of Christ. The couple had to wait for years until there was no biological proof that Sarah could have a son and then Isaac came showing us that God's promises can only be fulfilled by God. God is not the one who made Sarah barren. She was barren even before God called Abraham. She was barren while they worshipped their moon God Genesis 11 verse 30. But God used the barrenness to teach them about Jesus. So, all the time that Abraham was waiting for the promise, he was learning more about God's promise of Jesus. In fact, Abraham had to teach Sarah his wife about the promise of Jesus, and that was even why Sarah was able to have her womb revived and she gave birth to Isaac. Hebrews 11 verse 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Sarah received strength to give birth because she had faith in the promise. What was the faith for? What was the promise? The faith was the same one Abraham had when he received the gospel. The faith was towards the promise of Jesus. She believed that of a truth, through the lineage from her womb, the Messiah will be born. God came into Abraham's life and got permission from him to use his life and future generations as a classroom for his plan of Christ. How did Abraham give God permission? Well, God came and preached the gospel about Jesus to Abraham and told him what he was going to do and Abraham believed. Galatians 3 verse 8 says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, from the above verse, Abraham heard the gospel and believed. Jesus would say of Abraham, John 8 verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Next, we see God testing Abraham's faith. Truly God wasn't testing Abraham to see if you he would obey him. God knows all things. He knew if Abraham believed him or not. So, why did God had to test Abraham? Again, everything was a classroom session. God was teaching Abraham about Jesus. The test was to help Abraham understand how that, one, God would give up his only begotten son as Abraham did Isaac incarnation, Point two, God's son will die for sin instead of man. Just as the lamb was killed instead of Isaac's substitution. Point two, how that God would raise Jesus from the dead. Just as Isaac was raised from the dead, figuratively resurrection. Abraham wasn't as much as perturbed by the instruction to kill his son. Hebrews 11 verse 17 says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Again, remember the faith is Abraham's belief in the promise of Jesus. So he knew already that Isaac was the one through whom the Messiah would be born. So if God was asking him to go kill this same son, then that means God must have plans of resurrecting Isaac. Hebrews 11 verse 19 says, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. 
So Abraham didn't really see the whole charade as a test, because he already had this mind set and conviction. He wasn't offering Isaac while shaking and crying. He already believed God's word of the promise through Isaac, and God knew this. Did you read how this dude was ready to cut off his son's head? Nah, that guy was not passing through a test. His mind was already made up. Guy drew out his knife to kill his son. There was absolutely no doubt in his mind that Isaac will not be dead and gone. So, it was more of a learning period for Abraham. That was how God taught him about his plans and types and shadows. Now, Abraham's action after the event showed the revelation or understanding that he caught from the whole display. He didn't say, Oh God, thank you for sparing my son. I almost died of fear. No, rather see the revelation he caught. Genesis 20 to verse 14 says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So, the revelation or what he understood from the ordeal was that of a truth. God will provide his son for a sacrifice. In other words, he caught the revelation of the incarnation more perfectly. He learned that man will not pay for sins, but God will provide Jesus to pay for sins. Jehovah Jireh is from the root word translated as Ra'h which means the Lord sees for the one who sees or the Lord will provide. God used the whole scenario to teach him that he will see to the provision of the penalty for sin for man. This is what was taught and passed down to generations after generations. Genesis 20 to verse 14 says, To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This was how the Israelites taught their generations about the promise of the Messiah. It was ingrained into the very fabric of the average Jew, that a Messiah was coming. Their very life captured different explanations and revelations of this truth. That's why they lived all their lives hoping for the consolation of Israel. You can see why they were grossly disappointed when Jesus came as a peasant born in a manger. The truth is, they eroded the spiritual narrative of the promise and focused solely on the physicals. They didn't realize that their physical experiences were types and pointers to what God wanted to do spiritually. They didn't realize that the physical possession of lands as mentioned in the promised pointed to a spiritual narrative of Jesus and his rule in the hearts of men and not physical lands. They mistook blessing to mean wealth and pump and rulership. And that's why they wanted to crown Jesus king, but he shocked them when he said, My kingdom is not of this world. Funnily enough, their fathers of old understood the actual truth of the promise and not this misinterpreted form. The writer of Hebrews would say this about Abraham and others. Hebrews 11 verse 14 to 16 says, Obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They understood the promise. In all, I am trying to communicate to things. 1. The Christocentricity of the Bible How that this book is about Jesus, narrated from the physical narrative Old Testament and the spiritual narrative New Testament. 2. That God uses our experiences generally to teach us about himself. He doesn't orchestrate temptations for us or bring evil our way to try or test us, but he uses and allows the evils and tests we experience in this world to teach us about himself. So, let's make it a habit to look beyond our physical challenges deep into the spiritual lessons we can learn from them. So, when you're troubled, remember that the presence or manifestation of problem in the first place is because of a problem in the soul. Channel your hurts and circumstances to daring soul growth projects. You're graced continually.